thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful. I, I appreciate all the introductions, and, it's, and I want to say I'm, I'm grateful to be here, and needless to say, want to thank my good friend, Professor Jin Jin Hua. Um, I also want to point out, as I'm listening to everybody introduce themselves, uh, all the names that I present in my talk today, uh, the whole thing's on Japan. Uh, anyway, I gave Professor Chen three choices, and this is the one he chose. Anyway, um, I had one on China, but nonetheless. Um, all the names are in the traditional style with the surname first and the, and the given name second. Okay. Um, so again, uh, I also want to thank uh, the Tianzhou Global Network for uh, the support of this lecture series and, of course, the Frog Bear program. Um, the title of this talk is Cataloging uh, the Medieval Sacred Transmitted Documents. They're called Shogyo in Japanese, Shengjiao in Chinese, uh, from a temple called Shinpokuji, which is in Nagoya, and also Amano-san Kongoji, which is in Osaka. And by the way, I have lots of information up there. So we're going to be talking today about catalogs. And I'm going to break it into a number of parts. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about the medieval Buddhist books and libraries in Japan. Um, at least two or three of you. Uh, based on your introductions, we'll be reading these because it turns out that uh, the last 20, 30 years, since about 1990, uh, there's been a revolution in using Japanese manuscripts because, of course, we know about Dunhuang and uh, we have, where we have wonderful manuscripts. But uh, as I will be talking about, we don't know that much about them, whereas we have a lot of manuscripts in Japan that we know a lot about. Uh, the second thing I'm going to give is some context. Uh, notion, a little bit of comparative discussion of prayer, uh, uh, powerhouses of prayer. Uh, it turns out that we should be realizing that when we find a lot of manuscripts, uh, when we find a hoard, like even Dunhuang, we're looking at a lot of economic activity, and that's very important as well, and some comparative uh, research there. I'll be talking about catalogs and classifications of Buddhist literature in early Japan and from Dunhuang, some of the connections, uh, and then moving into manuscript versus printed Buddhist canons in East Asia. I'm assuming almost everyone in this room uh, reads the Tai Show. And I have tried to find nice things to say about the Tai Show, but I'm going to show you some problems with the Tai Show. Uh, I'm also then going to be moving into the main topic, which is on the sacred transmitted documents called Shogyo from Amano Son Kongoji, which is in Kawachi, uh, Kawachi Nagano, which is in southeastern Osaka. And I'll show you a few pictures as well. And Shinpukuji, which is part of the Osu Kanon Shrine in uh, Temple in Nagoya. Uh, and these are, by the way, there's about uh, 10,000 documents of Shogyo, uh, of these particular types of documents from uh, Amano Son Kongoji, and about 15,000 from Shinpokuji. So we're dealing with a lot of manuscripts. Okay. I'm also going to be talking about uh, specifically the catalogs that were copied by Zene, who did some remarkable work for Kongoji, and of course Yue, who did a lot of copying for uh, Shinpokuji. Um, I'm also going to be talking about where this possibly comes from. In other words, why do the Japanese cling on to this notion of shogyo? Where does it come from? Is there possibly continental uh, Korean or, or Chinese inspiration? And I hope we'll all consider why uh, East scholars of East Asian Buddhism, religious medieval history, and literature all really need to think about these documents a lot more than they have been studied. So first, what are shogyo? They are, I translate these as sacred transmitted documents. I've obviously added the word transmitted. Um, because they are usually very carefully copied documents. And I'll be introducing exactly how this works. They're not always religious, although they often are. They're cataloged locally, and that'll be the main focus of, of I hope, what you'll get from today's talk. They are preserved in three main libraries. One is a little bit more complicated, but I'll, I'll make some references to it. It's in uh, um, Yokohama. They were once a part of what we call shrine temple complexes, and I'm not going to spend much time on that, but as we move into medieval Japan, we have Buddhist temples, seven main temples, and then uh, these are actually provincial temples. But all of these temples are also connected to shrines to indigenous deities, which in Japanese we call kami or jingi. And that's a, a whole part of the shogyo study that I'm not going to spend much time on today. Um, what's significant is we're talking about documents that were copied from the 12th all the way to the 16th century. And I think most of you in this room, your eyes pop out, because we don't see this much in China. We have such a significant shift towards printing technology, and then, of course, the loss of so many manuscripts during the Ming uh, with the uh, Yongle Dadian, and then, of course, we have the Sukhu Chenshu during the Qing, and in addition to odd things that happen to Chinese Buddhist canons. Um, the sources that I'm using are two main uh, sources. The first one is was compiled in a number of volumes. We have 24 volumes of main texts, this is 5% of the entire Shinpokuji collection that has been published. 5% is 24 volumes. OK? 
Okay, so that's what we've had to work with. There's now a new series, uh, which is four volumes as of 2019, and almost all of the material that's come out is associated with Shinto. In other words, the study of indigenous Japanese religion. And the entire field of Shinto studies, almost all of it over the last 20 years, comes from the Shinpokuji collection. Abe Yasuro, of course, is, is a fantastic uh, scholar, uh, an amazing individual, and I, I owe everything that I've done here today to him in large part, as well as Professor, Professor Ochiai Toshinori, uh, who also worked uh, on the Kongoji canon. I'll be talking about what that is, and did an uh, interesting catalog uh, of some of the Shogyo materials. Professor Goto went back and did it again in 2015 because there were enough mistakes. Uh, and I think you'll see a little bit today why we should care. Um, there's two series Professor Goto did of very, very special documents in the Kongoji section. We have a lot more from Shinpokuji than we do, even though it's only 5%. Uh, we have gorgeous volumes uh, that have published in 2017 of the Kongoji stuff, including um, music. People never knew that there was music with notation uh, in East Asia before this, but we have it from Kongoji. Um, so these are some of the different sources that I'm using. So the first topic we're going to talk about is medieval Buddhist books and libraries in Japan. If you don't know the book, you probably should read it. Uh, it is, of course, Peter Kornitsky's book in Japan, A Cultural History from Beginnings to the 19th Century. There he gives us a brief overview of the topic that I'm sort of delving into here. So in the 8th century in Japan, we know that there was the establishment in Nara, the main capital, of sutra repositories and basically scriptoriums where we copy scriptures. Okay, it's part of the government office. We call this the Kyozo. What did they copy? They copied the Kaiyuan era Buddhist canon that was brought back to Japan in 736 uh, by Gimbo. This is the earliest copy of the Kaiyuan canon that anybody knows of anywhere. Okay, so obviously it was finished in 730, comes over to Japan in 736. A significant portion survives today, and we can study it. So they're copying that. We also know that another copy came over by a man named Chu, who studied in China at Ximingsi uh, for 30 years. And he came back on the same ship as Kukai did in 806. And he brought another copy of the canon, plus a lot more materials, to a monastery that's extremely, sadly, not very well known, which is Bonshakuji, uh, another area of my research. Um, and there, that's the first time that we see significant attention to commentaries. Okay? If you don't know the difference between scriptures and commentaries yet, you will by the time you come out of this lecture. Um, now, the main thing, hopefully some of this you've known before, but the thing you may not have thought a lot about is when we think about a library, we have to have a catalog. We need to know where things go. And we don't know anything about catalogs to libraries from Dunhuang, of course, and I'll mention that. We have some speculations about whether it was a library. Once upon a time, people thought it was trash. Um, we're just not sure. But in Japan, we have a lot of information. And we know that as we move into the 8th and the 9th century, we have specific catalogs that are produced for specific collections. The first one is 733. Uh, it's made for the Shogozo, or the Shosoin. And this is the collection of uh, the Sha uh, Daisho Jokyo Mokuroku, which is a commentary of the little and the big vehicle. I don't like the word Hinayana. Nobody does. And by the way, why is because my great teacher, Robert Buswell, explain to us why it's a very bad word. Um, but these are all the different scriptures. We don't have the commentaries here as of 733. But for the great monastery of Todaiji, we have the uh, Sha Shosho Mokuroku, which is a commentary, commentary catalog. It's the first one anybody knows of anywhere. There are references in China to this. We know that it must have existed. We've just lost them. Nonetheless, uh, so we start to see that they're also collecting commentaries, including 43 non-Buddhist treatises. This is your uh, Tang legal codes. This is your, your Bo Jui or your Bai Jui. They love him in Japan. Um, and of course, as we move into the beginning of the ninth century, then the situation is revolutionized because we have these pilgrims that go to China, and when they come back, they are forced to write catalogs of everything that they brought. Um, and these are, of course, in the Taisho canon. These eight pilgrims are called the Nitohake, and they wrote specific catalogs called Shorai Mokuroku. Okay. This is the beginning of where we see the development of relatively larger libraries in Japan and the development of some indigenous literature. Now, all of the Nitohake, these eight pilgrims, are the founders or individuals associated with the two early esoteric Buddhist traditions of Tendai and Shingon. Okay. Tendai comes first. 
It's one of the things history books are usually wrong about. The eight pilgrims, if you don't know them, uh, here's a list. I already mentioned Kukai. Saicho goes first, comes back in 805. He's the founder of the Tendai tradition up on Mount Hiei. Kukai, of course, is the founder of the Shingon tradition. Enin, Jogyo, Engyo, Eun, Enchin, and Shue. He's the last. Now, there aren't just eight, right? Of course, there's lots of pilgrims who go to Japan. Uh, excuse me, that go to China. But the main issue is that these eight, all of their catalogs, are catalogued for the first time. And this is a revolutionary moment in Japanese institutional Buddhism. Because what happens when Anen catalogs all of these individuals' books in the Shō Ajari Shingo Mikyō Burui Soroku, he's not just making a catalog, he's actually checking the editions of whose books are where in Japan. But he's not going to every library. Turns out even the Taisho edition of number 2176 will show you that he's cross-checking in two libraries, Bonshakuji and Engakuji, which is his own library. So at the end of the 9th century, uh, at the very turn, 902, beginning of the 10th century, we know that the main library in Japan institutionally is Bonshakuji. We also know that it's Tendai controlled. It's not, so we don't really have much of a Shingon tradition yet. And of course, Abe Ruichi's work from 20 years ago establishes this as well. So the libraries of Bonshakuji, Todaiji, and the other major temples in Nara before this uh, have books arranged in two parts. A canon called an Isaikyo, Ichiji. And this is very specifically the Kaiyu and Lu. No, it's not, but it's close to it. And then all the other stuff. Okay? And that other stuff is the commentaries to scriptures, the ritual manuals, the Giki, or the Shugyoho, um, and this would be mostly esoteric literature, as well as um, uh, ri ritual objects, um, portraiture, all kinds of other things that they bring back. All of these other things get cataloged as well. We don't have the term shogyo quite yet in 902. We don't see it anyway. Now, as we move up into the medieval period, the 12th to 14th centuries, we've seen a shift in Japan that we don't seem to see on the continent. Jōken, who is a, a famous Shingon monk, in the Shingon Shidai, which is a ritual manual, says that, quote, the correct books, the Shogyo, are those that guide disciples to the path through the great net of a wider web of teachings. Guidebooks include the Zhenyuan Lu and the secret records of the eight great pilgrims to Tang, China. So this is the substantiation where we get this from. Who established orthodox lineages and each discussed in Anen's catalog. So again, we can tell that people are still using Anand's catalog. They're still using something called the Genuine Lu. Okay? We also know that the, this is where in these catalogs, the, uh, in Anand's catalog, we have, again, material implements for ceremonies, initiation rituals, and special images of the Buddha. So it's not just books. These catalogs are key to understand what do the temples own that they can use in, the, in their uh, initiation ceremonies. The problem, however, between distinguishing the more recent books is a very famous Chinese reference to uh, looking at strokes in a similar character, which is a reference to the Lu Yu Hai Shi, very, very famous reference to mistaking characters. So this brings us to the idea that they're somewhat confused about what to do with new materials and this distinction between what goes on in Japan and what went on in China, even as we move all the way up into the 14th centuries. If you don't know what the Genyuan Lu is, it's the catalog after the Kaiyuan Lu. Now, the Kaiyuan Shijia Lu I'll mention in a moment, but the Genyuan Lu is the one everybody follows. It's the catalog of all the scriptures as of the year 800 in China. And the reason we care so much is between 730 and 800, we have all the translations by, or almost all the translations by Shubhakara Simha, Vajra Bodhi, and Amogavadra. And several of uh, Professor Chen's recent students have done uh, work on Amogavadra. So all of these 9th century pilgrims, they want to go to China to get the new translations that were done and listed in the Genyuan Lu. They're looking for them. They also want the ritual manuals to these new translations. And they want commentaries by Chinese and Korean authors. Now we think Korean, it's complicated. So therefore, the, the, the library, the Buddhist library has the canon and now has something called Shogyo in it. Now the actual, how do we know this? Well, it turns out it's relatively easy to find out. If you look at, at Gen 15 or Roll 15 of the Gen Yuan Lu, and this is the only, after this is the only slide with just Chinese, so I apologize. But 
General Lu 15 has a specific order of all the new translations dur done during the reigns of Emperor Xuanzong, Suzong, and Daizong. And it's exactly in this order, just five. I just showed you five scriptures, okay? Now, these five scriptures are exactly the same in Kukai's Shorai Mokuroku. Exactly. And here's just ten of them. Identical, except Kukai gives you the number of pages, number of pieces of paper that it takes to copy them out. So you can see that he's writing this for a library, but he's following exactly what the genuine Lu says. Okay? So it's a shopping list. Hence, it's a shopping list. The genuine Lu is a shopping list for 8th and 9th century pil pilgrims who want to bring back esoteric mikyo, media, teachings. But do not fool yourselves. They're also bringing back so-called exoteric or normative or regular, non-esoteric teachings. They want both. And in fact, these catalogs are filled with the, this material as well. So it's not a full switch to esoteric Buddhist teachings. Now, Taisho volume number 55, text 2177 to 2180, lists what happens next, which is the government says there's a mess. And emperors Uda and Daigo demand that there be catalogs of all this non-esoteric material. And there are five catalogs. They're in the Taisho, except they are the 1790 editions. Nothing wrong with 1790, but that means they're later woodblock editions. There's another catalog in there, which is Echo's Toiki Dento Mokuroku, which is another copy of the same thing. So the Japanese state, as we move into the 10th century, is terribly interested in making sure it knows what books are where and which ones are studied by which monasteries. So. 10th century monastic libraries have Shodai Mokuroku, which prompt the need for library catalogs, which were there. We just don't have them anymore. We know that on Mount Hiei and, and Miidera, which are the two great uh, Tendai monasteries, we have the Kompon Kyozo, the Shingo Zo, and the Sano Zo. We have three great monastery libraries during the 10th century which had catalogs. Only one part of one survives, which is an 891 catalog from Miidera which one half of the catalog survives with 1,090 texts. Okay? So we're talking about a very large number of texts. And of course we know about Bonshakuji. Todaiji and Kofukuji and Nara also had catalogs. And we know that Shingon Libraries Toji and on Mount Koya, uh, Kongo Buji also had catalogs. Almost all of this stuff is gone. It was burned or destroyed at some point. Hence, going back one slide, we have the 1790 edition of the texts, because almost all of this stuff was burned in various civil wars and things like that. Now, when we move into the 12th to 14th, century, 14th centuries, because of the material at Shinpukuji and Kongoji, we know exactly what was kept in libraries and copied for one disciple to a teacher, or perhaps to a bunch of disciples for one teacher. And they don't just copy esoteric texts. For example, it's because of this stuff that we know that the three main Tiantai teachings that are attributed to Tiantai Zhiyi were all copied in Shingon temples. Every single temple had all three. You have to, because it's Shogyo. Now, if you don't know this stuff, I can come back and explain it later, but I figured, why not? You're studying with Professor Chen. Everybody knows Zhiyi. Okay. Let's step back out for a minute. So, why should we care? Well, it turns out we're looking at an awful lot of economic activity. Paper making, we're talking about scribes, and of course we're talking about physical construction sites. Now, for reference sake, a couple of economic historians in, in Utrecht uh, have done some research back in 2009 and noticed that there are 17,352 manuscripts in Europe total between the year 500 to 1500, the advent of printing. Now, about 15,000 are dated, and they consist of, quote, among other things, Latin gospel books from the 5th to 8th centuries, mostly Latin gospel books, MML and J, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a couple of extras, literally not much else. Um, 9th century monastic catalogs and bestiaries from the 11th to 15th centuries. So lots and lots of copies of the same books. And of course, they're in parchment, which is significant because we don't do parchment in East Asia, we do paper. No need to kill animals. Now, the Latin Vulgate is technically the book that gets copied a lot, or the Gospels to it, which is a relatively small book. 
uh, in comparison to what we're talking about in East Asia. Technically, it's got 76 books in it, 76 specific chapters in it. Uh, uh, 46 in the so-called Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, 27 from the New Testament, and 3 from the Apocrypha. So, sounds like a lot, but as we all know, it's that thick. Okay? We all have visited the Taisho in the various library or on our computer. It's a wee bit larger. Okay? You probably know that the largest Buddhist text in Chinese, which is the Da Bo Re Jing, is three times larger than this, if it was ever translated. Okay? One text. And I, wanted, I like this quote from Michael Gorman thinking about a particular scriptorium, which is in, in, in uh, uh, Siena, in Tuscany, Italy. And he says, it is worthwhile to highlight the Abbey's economic history because manuscript production coincides with favorable economic factors. An active scriptorium depends upon a great library full of exemplars, original manuscripts, and both, uh, full of, and both require significant financial resources. A lot of money has to go into paying for this. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on with the Japanese state, uh, whether it's the imperial uh, family or whether it's the monasteries themselves, to be able to afford something similar? Many peasants also must work hard to raise the sheep, make the parchment, and produce the wealth to be consumed by the monks toiling away in the abbey's library and scriptorium. Now, obviously, we don't have to have sheep to make parchment in East Asia, but we do have to make paper, and we have to have a lot of monastics. So we have to ask a lot of economic questions. What's going on in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries in Japan? Now, back to East Asia. What's wrong with printed canons? Well, nothing if you like to search them online everything if you care about what the, what's in them. The first thing is the printed canon, as we know it, of course, is all traces back to the Kaibaozang, which is a, a uh, copy according to records preserved in Korea and Japan, different talk, uh, that is exactly 5,048 rolls long, and this is exactly what the, what the Kaibao canon was supposed to have. No commentaries, no catalogs, nothing written by any East Asian author, Korean or any other way, and not any of the ritual manuals translated after 730. They were not in this canon, published in China in 983. The Taisho edition that we all use today, of course, is almost exactly 100 years old, uh, which we can use C-beta or we can use uh, SAT to, to search it. Hopefully I'm not the first person to point out that the Agamas, the Ahan, does not belong at the beginning of an East Asian Buddhist canon. This is not the first place to do it. There's one example in Chinese history. Out of the 28 other canons, there are none. What always comes first is the Prugna Paramita, the Bora. Okay? So that's weird. The Taisho also includes commentaries by East Asian authors. That's weird. We don't do that. That's not part of the canon. Shouldn't be in there. Where'd they get them from? I told you that earlier. They pulled them out of strange records according to the history of Japan. They also have sectarian texts and lots of weird catalogs. If you hang out in volume 55, you will find a bunch of catalogs to Japanese libraries. So in other words, you're viewing all of the history of the Buddhist canon through Japan, even though there's just one small factor. Nobody ever printed a Buddhist canon in Japan. Or did they? I'll be talking about that in a minute. The history of printed canon itself is something we've all talked about, which is that the Taisho, of course, prioritizes the second Korean canon. Uh, not the first, because it's gone, and it may highlight the Kitan canon. So this is what the Taisho does, as opposed to the entire history of printing in China. So it's a strange document, historically, and hagiographically, and philologically. Now, the only thing we can find in the entire Taisho that gives us a catalog of all those commentaries and all that stuff East Asian people might have actually read or cared about is one Korean monk's catalog, which is Yichan's supplement of commentaries. Now that's a different talk, but it's one text. It's a very important text, but it's only part of the picture, and it's from Korea. I haven't said much about Korea. Oops, there's the Korean canon. On the ground, we see something very different, which is manuscript canons that we see in Japan and one place else, which is Dunhuang. We see something very different. We see, first of all, that the actual manuscripts are usually marked that they belonged to a library. Okay? Over here on the left, I have Stein 73755, which has the mark of Sanjie Si uh, Tangjing. So it's the library of Sanjie Si. This has led Rongxinjiang to say, hey, I think this is a library. 
Uh, in Japan, we have the name of the canon written all over the manuscripts. This happens to be the one I've studied quite a bit, which is the Matsuo Isaikyo, which is again a manuscript canon. Uh, they're very similar in terms of the number of characters, the additions, things like that to Dunhuang. They don't match the Taisho at, uh, at all. Now, when it comes to Dunhuang, as I just mentioned, we believe, speculation seems to be, as of 2019, that it's probably not a proper library, but mostly a library of materials that was put together after the Tibetan occupation period. So that's what we think we're looking at when we see documents like this which is Stein 3624, which deals with the order of the text. Of course, we have the Great Perfection of Wisdom, we have the Maharatna Kuta, we have the Hua Yanjing, like this. But you will not see this order of texts anywhere in the Taisho, but you'll see it all over Japan. So the only place we can actually look to find evidence, other evidence, is usually in Japan for this kind of activity. But the key thing is that we do see included in the library the catalog. So in other words, they cataloged in China. Of course they did. We just don't have the records. Back to Japan. Of course we do in Japan. And it's quite extensive. And there's two subjects, the canon or the shogyo. Now, the canon itself, we have eight or nine of them. And they're almost all copied for the kami, or the indigenous deities. The one I just mentioned is the Matsuo canon, Nanatsudera, that Professor Chen mentioned I've studied earlier. These ones have cool stuff like stamps that explain, this is the Nanatsudera canon, and it's explaining that it is vowed for a bunch of deities in Issei and the area around Issei, the imperial shrine. Okay, this is from Nagoya. Shinpukuchi is also in Nagoya, but this is just the canon. We don't see any of the commentaries included in this particular text. By the way, almost all these manuscript canons were copied during the 12th century, which is another subject. Now, the canons themselves were obviously kept in some kind of repository called a kyozo or uh, a um, jingzang. The three that I've mentioned are Matsuo, Amano Son Kongoji, and Nanatsudera. Now, it turns out there is a canon that has been studied independently from Kongoji. But what was not originally studied is all the other stuff that was sitting with the canon. Because it turns out that Matsuo and Nanatsudera don't have other chests. And that's what we're looking at, chests. That's how you store texts. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, Kongoji. Uh, yes, Kongoji. Okay, so first of all, Kongoji is the actual women's koya, if you visit Japan. People, lots of places tell you it's the woman's koya, but this is the actual women's koya, because women could come to this particular site. It's the gateway to the pilgrimage up to Mount Koya uh, and, and the traditional Shingon uh, home where Kukai is said to be an eternal meditation. There was a network developed around Mount Koya of provincial temples moving into the 13th and 14th centuries. And specifically, we have Kumeradera, Negoroji, Koya-san, Todaiji up in uh, Nara, and then Kongoji's right in the middle. This probably explains the, the reason why we have such a large repository here. Where are these things? Today, as you can see, it's not very far, by the way. Uh, it's, it's about, I mean, it takes a long time to walk, but not a train. You know, we're 15 kilometers or so apart. Okay, so we're relatively close. And again, I show this for two reasons. Most of you are studying China. And if you saw this distance in China, you're talking about downtown Hangzhou or something. Okay? Slightly further afield, the two main repositories that we're looking at here, one, of course, is in southeastern Osaka. The other one is in Nagoya. So these are clearly connected in some way as well. And there's been a lot of interesting research on the significance of Nagoya, where we have the Nanatsudera canon individually, and then the Shinpukuji materials. Okay? Now, I'm concerned with uh, the medieval catalogs compiled by two individuals, because everything I've talked about so far is technically stuff you should know as PhD students. No. But, realistically. Um, we don't actually have any shogyo collections at all from the large monastic estates in medieval or early Japan. We have nothing from Todaiji, Kofukuji, Toji, Daigoji, and Rakuji, Miidera, Kongobuji. We can keep going. It doesn't mean we don't have texts. We have later texts. We have printed things, and I'm going to show you those. But we don't have the texts that they worked with. And we don't have re any real catalogs that are close to this time. They're mostly post-17th century. 
The extant collections, therefore, mostly are from the early 14th century and a little bit back into the 13th, are all from Shingon temples, Kongoji, Shinpokuji, and one more, Shoumyoji, which is in Yokohama. That one is another kettle of fish I'll deal with on another day, if you wish. But um, some research has been done on that. Now, the problem is that what's on the left part of the slide is what I would like you to think about. But when you visit temples, even in Japan, what you usually see is the sutra repository with the rotating sutra case for printed texts. Because, you see, the Japanese loved Korean printed documents after we move into the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, and then we need a place to put them. So we literally have the Taisho on one hand and the Rinzo on the other, and we completely forget about the actual on-the-ground life of Buddhism all around these things. And of course the Japanese did not just read Korean documents. <clears throat> now, Amano Song Kongoji I'm going to talk about first because it's slightly earlier. The library is a fascinating case. Again, I'm going to come back to my network of Komiradera, Negoroji, and Koyasan. What happens here, and this is the, the, the sort of the most technical part of, of the talk, what we have developed based on these Shogyo documents is very intimate knowledge of a network of one teacher and a couple of disciples who seem very, very interested in cataloging and copying their master's works. Very specifically, we're looking at Kakuban, who establishes Negaroji, which is right here. Uh, and he restores a very important assembly, which is an opportunity to lecture for the members of the imperial family, which had been fallen out of favor at this particular temple. Which, inst which immediately signals two things. By the time we move into the 12th century, clearly the, the center of power in Japan has moved out into the provinces because of warfare and other things like this. Now, this particular individual, Kakuban, is someone who influences the man who establishes uh, Kongoji as a temple in 1181. Turns out that most of the manuscript canon kept here is earlier than 1181, which tells us they bought it, or they borrowed it, from somewhere else. The Shogyo, on the other hand, start around uh, the end of the 12th century, moving into the 13th and 14th. And very specifically with one individual named Ryu. And the key point here is that he's a very important Shingon monk, who has lineage in the Shingon tradition with two great temples. Daigoji, which is in Kyoto, and another one which is on Mount Koya. Why do we care here? Because lineage is something we almost always think about with Zen, or Tan, Buddhism, when it is something essential in the Shingon tradition as well in Japan. Now, I'm not going to say anything about whatever that may have been in China. We don't know. Professor Chen can say that. But, nonetheless, this is also a time when we see a reformed curriculum in other words, we're studying, we're taking tests, not because the state says so. We're not even following the monastic codes. We believe that you have to take certain tests to have certain levels of office in provincial temples, and we need documents to study. Exoteric and esoteric. Okay? Now, two of, three, two of three of Ryu's disciples are the ones we have to blame or thank for almost all the shogyo in Shimpukuji and Kongoji which is quite an interesting story in and of itself. Noshin establishes uh, Shinpukuji at the very beginning of the 14th century, in the 1320s. Whereas we know that Zenne is not the individual who establishes Amano Son Kongoji, but he's an individual who copies much of the Shogyo materials. And we're dealing with 53 large boxes. Large boxes with almost 10,000 documents individually. And he does this very specifically at a cloister at Kongoji, which he also sometimes calls Amano Dera. And this is where we talk about colophons. Earlier I had a, something on the slide, just to get the corner of your eye, on the subject of colophons. Colophons are a very big deal in Dunhua. They're a massive deal in Japan. Because they tell us a lot of information. And this is where we sort of begin the main thrust, which is there are four catalogs, there are a lot more than four, but four main ones out of Kongoji that deserve very special attention. The first one is called Shin Shorai Roku. Now this is an exact copy of the one Kukai made, except that then he goes and says, I'm going to look at the stuff that I don't 
have. Nonetheless, we know that he copied the first edition of this particular text, which is a copy of Kukai's, was copied in 1277, and then we know that Zene recopies that text in 1325. Okay? Not so exciting. It's about colophons. In 1363, he does it again. He takes the same text, and he very carefully explains to us that I've double-checked what I did back in 1325. So I'm doing something with this list that Kukai begins with. In other words, I'm building a library, and I'm cataloging that library. Now, that's just one of his catalogs. Then he has another one where he explains all of the texts he doesn't have. And he wants to go get them. Where are you going to get them? Obviously in neighboring libraries. And then he makes a catalog of ritual manuals, which is going to bring us to the main thrust. You catalog everything, and then you come back and get the Shingon stuff, the stuff that's very, very close to your own lineage. Now, interestingly, in that first text, <clears throat> he uses a stamp, and he marks it with Ken texts, Ken Mitsu, Ken texts, Xian texts, because he wants to make it very clear that one of the great teachers of the Shingon lineage back in China, Mogavadra, translated non-esoteric texts. And he wants everybody to know, because he doesn't like them. That's what people thought for a long time. And then people said, actually, those are the ones you have to study, because the other ones everybody knows. So just a couple are here. He also stamps, I want to point out, what printed texts exist. We know from the Shinpokuji materials and the Kongoji materials that we have lots of printing going on in Japan, going all the way back to the 13th century, not just Zen texts. Now, these are just three of the exoteric translations by Omogavadra, and um, it's interesting because when you specifically start to think about uh, the way in which we think about esoteric Buddhism, exoteric Buddhism, what should be in there, it's very interesting to use these categories because anytime you see uh, Manju Shri, in particular, you almost always get Western scholarship saying this is esoteric Buddhism, it's ritual. Uh, very, very, very clearly, Zene says, no, it has to be within this line of ritual practice. Okay? So this is, you know, food for thought. And he gives us one on the printed text from Mount Koya. The catalog of the printed text on Mount Koya. On 1323, he copies a text, and he says, every single one of these texts that you can read so carefully, I have another slide that you can read, but explains what we're going to print on Mount Koya. Obviously, we're going to print the two great esoteric tantras, the Mahavarochana Sutra, or Tantra, however you want to deal with that, and the uh, Sarvatathagata Tarpasamgraha, or the otherwise known as the Vajrasekara, either of those texts, and all the commentaries to it. We're also going to uh, deal with a couple of other texts that will be brought up in March. This one, which is a commentary to the Awakening of Faith. Odd Shingon text. A, a, a colleague of mine in Korea works on this particular text. And then this beautiful colophon where he explains that he is a, a, an adamantine or diamond disciple of the Buddha. I would not use adamantine, but Robert was here. He always calls it adamantine. Robert Buswell. Anyway, so he calls himself Kongo Bushi Zene. So he's saying that I am a disciple. But I'm going to show you all the different xylographic printing in medieval Japan. He's going to tell you Ishing's commentary to the Dainichi Kyo is printed. He's going to tell you that Chikwang's Shitanjiki, how to write Sanskrit letters, is printed. We know that he's going to, he's going to print. Uh, he's telling us that on Koya they printed the Sango Shiki, the essentials of the three teachings by Kukai. And a, another long list there, which we didn't know before this catalog. There's nowhere else that tells us this. Most of this material is lost. So in addition, because of these materials, we know that there's something called the Kasugaban, which I can show you an example in a minute, printed in Nara. We know that Todaiji printed, Saidaiji printed in Kyoto, uh, Mount Hiei printed, Senyuji printed, Chionin, a very famous Pure Land temple, printed texts. But they didn't print the entire Buddhist canon as in Korea or in China. They print specific things that are relevant to them. And of course, everybody knows about Gozan Zen printing, okay? which is another topic in and of itself. But it's all going on at the same time. In case you're wondering what it looks like, the Kasugaban Jōyu Shikiron, or the Vignapni Matra Tassidi Shastra. This is, of course, a beautiful, probably 
14th century, since it falls between 13th and 15th, we don't know the date. But you'll notice that it has marks and punctuation in red ink. This was a used text. These, you don't print text just for fun. You print them to use them. Okay. The Koyaban, Shin Shorai Kyoto Rokuroku. This is the one that gives us an interesting story about what Kukai's text may or may not have looked like. This is one that we have in the National Diet Library. It's got lots and lots of reading marks all over it. And mind you, it also tells us that that first list I showed you that's in the Taisho, between both lining up, don't line up anymore. So something's happened. But that's a tangential issue. The point is, we have a lot of printing in Japan. We just don't print the canon. Shinpokuji, we're almost done. Shinpokuji has more catalogs, lots more catalogs, and really interesting catalogs with much, much of the same material. I'm only going to focus on four of the catalogs. Three of them were copied by Yue, and these are significant because we have more uh, catalogs in a, in a slightly more uh, systematic fashion. In 1356, he copies something called the Shogyo Mokuroku Shinpukuji. Not that surprising, except for now we have the word Shinpukuji all over it. And Shogyo. Shogyo is there in the Kongoji documents, but it's not a main category. Clearly, here it is. This is look cataloging mostly Shingon ritual texts copied by the first to third abbots, abbots of uh, Shinpukuji, no Shin, Shinyu, and Ninyu. The second is the Shogyo Mokuroku Katsuryu Moku, Mokuroku, which is where he goes to another temple to tell what he got from those temples to bring into the library. Number three, the Shingon Sho. Now in medieval Japan, Shingon is the name of a sect, but we don't use it much. It actually means esoteric texts, esoteric books, with Tendai has lots of them too. The Mokuroku. And he gets this at Kuana Daifukuji which is uh, in Ise, near Ise Shrine. So it's another library we never knew about. And by the way, this is where you get the whole stuff about Ise and Shingon Buddhism together by Fabio Rambelli and other scholars. Without these documents, we wouldn't know this. And he copies this one also in 1356. So he's a busy beaver. And he's, and he's cataloging everything, and he's making a library. And then we jump ahead to a very interesting collection that I'm just going to sort of end with, which is the Osu Kyozo Mokuroku, which is probably somewhere around the end of the 16th century, because things look very, very different at this time. Uh, just to show you that there seems to be a shift, and the big shift is that we organize according to the Sanskrit alphabet or something. It's weird. I'll show it to you. Okay. Oops. The Shogyo Mokuroku Shinpukuji, first of all, you always have Siddham all over everything to show that you know some of the characters. Ta. Okay? We start up here with the Shogyo Mokuroku, and then we move immediately, not into traditional normative Buddhist texts, or anything translated in China, but Japanese commentaries. Nothing by Kukai, everything from after, Kakuban. Uh, another guy by the name of Raishin. Uh, Rayu, all of their texts are in here. And this is what we're doing in this particular edition. And we've got lots of interesting stuff as we move into the Amida Shidai. So we have Pure Land devotional practice as well included in this practice. We're, all these are ritual texts, okay? And as you can see, we really like to show off that we write Sanskrit. The Shogyo Mokuroku Katsuryu Moku, uh, Mokuroku here, again, also by Yue. Here's his lovely colophon where he explains what he's doing in this particular text. This is the stuff he gets from a related library. And again, what's interesting here is, again, he's starting with commentaries by Japanese authors. Okay, not Koreans, not mainlanders. That other material must be somewhere else. So now we can see that we know what we're going to put in the library, and it's for internal consumption. And the Shingon Sho Mokuroku Kwana Dai Fukuji. Here, interestingly, another category, but the arrangement has changed. We have, we're going to go through all the celestial elements. We're going to start with T and D and go on down through. So we're, we're now moving into a world in which we want to arrange our own materials. Here, we're just going to list them. Sort of, this is the stuff I got first, and we're going to go from there. Perhaps associate, it doesn't really seem to be based on my teacher, your teacher. It's just kind of listed. Maybe it's the, it's the stacks or some the boxes. We don't know. But finally, the celestial arrangement again keeps going, and a lovely colophon explaining what he's up to. 
And finally, the Osu Kyozo Mokuroku. This is where we move into, back to a world in which we might recognize. We start with the actual contents of the Sutra Repository with the number one most important Buddhist text, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. Why? What is the one text in East Asia that is known for giving everyone the teaching that everyone is enlightened? Which you have to have in Shingon Buddhism. So you start with the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, then you go to the Mahavaipulya, which are other texts related to it, then you move into uh, Fadzang and others' favorite, the Hua Yen Jing, and the 25,000 line Prajna Paramita. And then you move into the Da Ru Jing, Gai Ni Kyo. So now we're seeing a canon like thing included with the Shogyo. And very important that we note who the translators are. We care a lot who Kumara Jiva was. So we're moving into a different stage, a different world. And of course, we're arranging everything according to Sanskrit. Siddham. Here, except Shinto texts. Anyway, just a few pictures here. Second to last point. I don't have to stop there, but I will. So, that's not the only type of catalogs we have here. We also see in Shinpukuji a bunch of catalogs from other monasteries, specifically the non Shingon monasteries. We're looking at all the Vinaya texts that were used in the 10th century and 11th century. We're looking at a weird text uh, which is pulling all different versions and checking against the Kayu and Lu. We're looking at all the scriptures, commentaries, and sub-commentaries to the Pure Land School, only preserved here. And we're looking at a major library in Todaiji and another one on Mount Koya, and a weird collection of the writings of Rayu. So this is remarkable, the extent of cataloging. It's exactly what, if you study European libraries, you would expect to see. But we don't see them in China, and we don't see them in Japan if we live in the world of the printed canon, or we live in the world of post 16th, 17th century Japan. The very last thing I'm going to close with is where does the idea of shogyo come from? We don't know. Nobody says so. It's possible. There is a special copy in Shimpukuji, one, and also in Amanoson, Kongoji, and also in Nanatsudera individually, of the preface that is at the very beginning to every one of Shenzong's translations in Tang Canons, where the preface calls Buddhism Sheng Jiao, Shogyo. So the fact that that is in there and kept in these libraries seems to suggest to people that maybe that's where the idea is. The teachings of Buddhism are the sagely teachings, Sheng Jiao, the, 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 the special documents. And this is, of course, Taizong's preface. So, my conclusion, manuscripts, canons, give you a completely different history on the ground, frog bear, from the ground up. This is definitely the product, uh, not of anything that I did in terms of cluster research uh, over the three years I did it, but it's sort of the next stage of where we're going in terms of trying to get deep into understanding what does Buddhism look like in terms of the transmission from the continent to Japan, but also back and forth with Korea, and exactly where do we get our ideas of textual history from, uh, that may or may not fit as we move into the 21st century in terms of sectarian definitions. As you can see, we have an awful lot of sectarian texts here. And of course, we also are seeing an awful lot of local cataloging, local attention, and a lot of money and economic activity in Japan. Thank you.